Come on, come on. Okay, we're live on YouTube. Here we go. Good morning and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of October 1st, 2020. Per Executive Order 29-20, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act, most of the commissioners will be participating via teleconference and no members of the public will be in attendance at this meeting in the interest of public safety. For the Brown Act, we have posted notice of the meeting agenda 72 hours in advance. This meeting is being broadcasted on YouTube and we are using the Zoom platform for conducting the meeting. Applicants and speakers will be calling into the meeting and you will be placed in an electronic waiting room until uh, we call on you to speak. When it's your turn, please turn off any background noise. And even when you enter the meeting, please stay muted until it's your turn to speak. And I would ask the planning commissioners to do the same thing. I would now like to take a roll call. As I call your name, please indicate if you are present. Commissioner Austin. Present. Commissioner Boomhauer. Present. Commissioner Granowitz. Present. Commissioner Moden. Present. Commissioner Otsuchi. Present. Vice Chairman Whalen. Did we lose him? He's, he's muted. Oh. He's Just raise your hand there, Commissioner Whalen. You're muted. <clears throat> Just note for the record that Vice Chairman Whalen is present and Chairman Hoffman is present. The staff members present today in uh, our meeting room here are PJ Fitzgerald, Deputy Director of Development Services. Uh, we have Brian Schoenfish with the Planning Department. Uh, other staff members who are participating remotely via the teleconference, I think I saw uh, Deputy City Attorney Corinne Newfer uh, and City Engineer Tony Khalil. And I just want to let everybody know that as you look at us here, uh, there's a little bit of an optical illusion because of the uh, camera and this room situation, but we all are practicing uh, correct social distancing. We will be wearing masks when we're not speaking and we are all at least uh, six feet apart. So with that, I'd now like to begin uh, our agenda and we're going to start with the public comments for items that are not on the agenda today. And I understand we do have one speaker uh, and that speaker is William Ferguson. And Mr. Ferguson, are you there? I am here. Can you, can everyone hear me? We can hear you and please go ahead. Okay. Hello. Um, I guess my name's already been introduced. I don't have to do that. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a citizen of San Diego and I've lived on Diamond Street in Pacific Beach for the past four or five years. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you guys. Uh, thank you for all of your hard work. It can't be easy creating plans that affect the city and the citizens when the ground is constantly shifting beneath your feet. So I just want you to know that what you do is sincerely appreciated. Um, I just wanted also to let you guys know that I watched an archive video of last week's meeting and heard a bit of discussion on keeping some of the COVID programs like street dining as a permanent fixture in San Diego's landscape. Um, I'd like to add to that sentiment today. Uh, sometime in April of this year, Several of the streets were partially closed off and designated as slow or walking streets. Uh, Diamond Street, where I live, was among those streets. Uh, I've spoken to quite a few of my neighbors uh, here in PB, on Diamond, and in the surrounding area, and we are delighted with the activity that we now see. So the street is safer. Uh, it's filled with bikers, runners, rollerbladers, skaters, and just about every healthy physical activity that you could imagine. So if possible, we'd like to keep Diamond Street as a slower walking street, and we'd be much obliged if you would assist us in that endeavor. Uh, and that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, thank you for your time and have a great weekend. Hey, thank you very much. 
And that is our only non-agenda public speaker. So we'll go to the rest of the agenda. Uh, there are no items uh, requested to be continued or withdrawn. And there are no consent agenda items. So with that, we will keep with the agenda that we have. And are there any director's reports? None. None. There are no director's reports. So we'll go into commission comments. And I will just look by, just lift your hand up if you'd like to make a comment because I think I can see everyone. Uh, Commissioner Moden. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I meant to bring this up at the last meeting because it was something from the meeting prior that I wanted to mention. Um, I would appreciate it if we could get community planning group meeting minutes or um, some kind of summary of their vote. We didn't have that on, I believe it was the 9G project. Um, and it was hard to understand um, why there was a discrepancy in the vote because like, from memory, I think there was like seven people opposed to it. So um, I had to ask staff what that was. And I think it would be best coming from the community planning group itself if the meeting minutes aren't ready to be included in the staff report, if we could get some kind of letter that summarized the events of that meeting would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, that's, that's a good comment. Um, and I think for the most part, we've been getting those, uh, but you're right, every time if they're available, uh, it would be great for us to get a copy of that. Are, are there any other commission comments? Can I say something? Uh, yeah, let me get to We'll go back. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's probably better if we if we discuss it when we get to the to the code update uh, item. But uh, uh, I would like to have staff comment um, at some point uh, where we're at on the idea of the keeping the outdoor areas uh, open. And perhaps it's better in the later item. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Granowitz. Um, Commissioner Moden, what I wanted to say about planning committees is they don't always include um, information about their discussion. And I wish they would, but they don't always do that. So perhaps we can have the planners, if they have attended those meetings, be able to give something. Um, otherwise, there would have to be some change in how we direct CPGs to do their minutes, which would be an issue for 600-24, which I'm sure nobody wants to update. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments? Okay, seeing as there's no other comments, uh, we'll go right into our first discussion item. This is a continued item from the September 24th and the August 20th meetings, 1398 Lieta Street and staff, uh, do you have a presentation? Um, and staff is entering the room, so we'll let them get ready. Um, and just let me know when you're ready to present. Let's get me a presentation. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Jeff Peterson. I'm the development project manager for the Lieta project. Can everybody see the screen that's on for the PowerPoint? Okay, I'm seeing yes. So we'll go right into it. Should the planning, uh, the project before the commissioner is for the demolition of a single family resident and construction of 13 dwelling units with two uh, three story buildings on a designated site located at 1398 Lieta Street. And it was HRB site number 1305. The project as previously indicated uh, will require a mitigated negative deck and, and, and mitigation and monitoring report program, site development permit, neighborhood development permit, and a tentative map. 
The project was first heard at the August 20th planning commission hearing and was continued to st September 24th to allow for the applicant to address planning commissioner's concern regarding the landscaping and the facade adjacent to the single family dwelling unit to the east. On September 24th, the above reference project was uh, continued to October 1st to allow for the applicant additional time to address the planning commissioners. The applicant's revised design was actually submitted with a memo to the planning commission is also on the planning commissioner's website. Just to give a little background from the previous meeting, the, um, the subject project property is a 0.615 acre parcel located at 1398 uh, Lietta Street in the CC 4-5 zone and the RS 17 zone within the Claremont, uh, Claremont Mesa Community Planning Area. And it also includes the Claremont height restriction requirement of 30 feet. The subject pro property contains a single family res residence that was constructed in 1937 and a garage constructed in 1956. The site was designated as HRB site 1305 on July 26, 2018. Uh, under HRB criteria A as a special element to the Izuzu Japanese American agricultural practices within the Mission Bay area during the 1930s through the 1950s and the restrictive property rights and ownership measures taken against minorities, specifically Japanese nationals during the 1930s and then through the 1950s. The, this designation of the site, uh, this is the designation of the site did not include the designation of the structures. And just re, uh, refresh the location. Here are a couple of the aerial photos. This is, um, the first one is from, Lietta is up on this area, front, front looking towards the east, looking towards the west. Once again, looking to the east, looking to the west. And this is the adjacent, looking towards the north. And also this is a view from the site uh, along Marina Boulevard. The slope is within the public right of way. The property line starts at the top of the slope. The applicant's presentation will provide details, um, more details regarding the changes to, to the project uh, that addresses the planning commissioner's concerns, but briefly, the changes included moving the building back two feet and also changes to design to the eastern facade adjacent to the single family residence. The changes also included um, adding um, landscaping to the slope area within public right of way, change the trees along the western property line, and added landscaping in front of the buildings. All the changes did not, did not um, interfere with the um, public views to, from the public right of way towards the ocean and towards downtown. So none of the landscaping would block that or none of the changes would block that view. This is also the, as you can see, the along the Western um, um, property, there was a requirement for HRB to have a uh, just, uh, decorative fencing. Well, the proposed trees would not block or interfere with that decorative fencing. The, the color renderings are shown here and the planning, uh, the applicant will actually go into more details on their color renderings and what the changes that are, in, what changes that were uh, done, <clears throat> excuse me. On June 16, 2020, the um, Claremont Community Planning Group voted 10 to recommend denial of the project. They stated their, uh, reasons as discussed in the, at the last hearing and also outlined in the report to the Planning Commission. Also on May 28, 2020, the HRB voted 10 to recommend to the Planning Commission to adopt the permit findings and mitigation measures associated with the site development permit for the staff recommendation with additional requirements as discussed at last hearing and outlined in the report to the Planning Commission. Staff's recommendation to the Planning Commission is to adopt the mitigated negative deck uh, and also adopt the mitigation monitoring program and approve site development permit, neighborhood development permit, and tentative map. This concludes staff's presentation. We'll go in, um, the applicant has a presentation. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before we start the applicant's presentation, uh, are there any clarification questions uh, from the Planning Commission? And if so, I can't see you at this point, so just speak up if there are. Okay, seeing as there's none, let's go to the applicant's presentation. So uh, Polly's gonna be doing the presentation. This is Mike Fulton, the uh, applicant, but uh, my landscape architect is actually in the waiting room and he was hoping to come in to help answer questions if there were any for him. Mm. Oh my God. Okay, just a couple seconds, we'll get him in. Thank you, sorry. Okay, well, hold on. He's got, he's got to stop sharing. Oh, do you need me to stop sharing? Yes, please. Uh, stop sharing. My apologies. That's okay. Who do I need to let in? Who do I need to let in? Who, do, who did you say I needed to let in from the waiting room? Polly. Sorry, it's a Brian Grove. Oh, sorry. I thought he said Polly. Mm -hmm. You must have the last digit numbers 8312. What's his name? Brian. Brian, Brian are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Please begin. Go ahead, Polly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, this is Polly DiBartolo with DBRDS representing the, the design team and the client on the uh, project in front of you. Um, given that this is a follow-up presentation, uh, would you like me to walk through the entire project again or would you like me really to speak to the uh, changes that were implemented based on the feedback from Planning Commission? I'll, I'll defer to the rest of the commission, but my preference would be just to go right to the changes. Okay. Happy to do so. So I'm going to skip portions of the presentation just to get to that. So, um, so as uh, as Mr. Peterson explained, um, the two comments that we we got from the planning commission to really go back to work on were the relationship of our project to the adjacent neighboring properties um, on the eastern side of the project. Uh, and also kind of the general landscaping and softening of the overall project as uh, we had focused our landscaping on the front or on the west side of the project, which and a small amount here along our southern property line, but that left the building itself quite stark and, and um, a little bit more hardscape than soft. So from a planning standpoint, what we did was we actually pushed the building back two feet towards the north and we aligned the uh, straightened out the fire access and roadway and what that what those two things did for us was it enabled us if you can see in in the front portion of our buildings right here along the extension of Tonopah which currently shows no green space it allowed us to implement a series of linear planters that provided significant softening across the front of the building um, you'll see that in a second. I've got both before and after renderings to show you the impact of that softening. Um, and you can see here the, the fire lane, um, the way that, uh, anyway, sorry. So the next, the next issue was the relationship to the neighbor. And so I wanted to give you just a, a, a plan here that showed you we're proposing a five foot setback from the neighbor, but in the previous version of the project, um, being a three story project, staying underneath the 30 foot height, Claremont Mesa height limit, um, the building was a three story flat line at that point, which I can understand was a little bit more of an abrupt uh, relationship to the adjacent neighbor. Since our previous planning commission uh, presentation and today, our developer client, Mike Fulton, has actually had numerous conversations and visited with this impacted neighbor several times. And um, we've worked on a couple of different mitigation techniques that that neighbor is in support of. Now I believe they may call into this to share support. But from a planning standpoint, um, in addition to kind of communicating with that neighbor and, and, and getting their comfort, we made uh, two changes, two prominent changes to that eastern elevation um, the first one, and I'm going to show you this in a rendering in a minute, but I wanted to show you here in, in an elevation. 
The first one was that we previously, you can see the outline of the overall building. This is this was what was previously our flat three-story tall wall. So what we did was looking at the context of the neighborhood, predominantly the, the strong majority of, of roof structures in the neighborhood facing east or to the east of our project are all uh, pitched roof projects. So what we did was we set back 18 inches, the ends, uh, the upper level, the third story of our building, but enabled uh, pushing, pushing that third story in on the ends and across the top enabled us to create a pitched roof element. So while this is in flat uh, 2D elevation, it's a little hard to, to get that relationship, but the intent was that we create an expressed two story with a roof element scale um, facing that neighborhood and then the upper level, everything here that's the light dot hatch above sits back 18 inches to give a true kind of depth to the building scaling back. So we, we intentfully tried to use the bulk and scale of the project to in, uh, really promote a two story with a roof element scale. And in addition to that, and you'll see on the renderings, um, previously this was all uh, a stucco elevation with some um, color blocking and, and different stucco troweling techniques to create some interest we put that aside and actually reintroduced a brick material. So what you'll see here on the renderings is not only are we trying to in bulk and scale, trying to address a scaling up from the adjacent single one and two story scale developments around us up to our three story through, through bulk and scale um, redesign, but also through the introduction of more, more uh, contrasting materials to give a much more defined two story and roof scale. <clears throat> so this is this is the previous um, east elevation. So it's kind of looking west along our project, but it's on the right hand side. You can see here this is that three story flat elevation that I spoke of, and some of the color. It's light shades of gray and color troweling that would have given some visual interest uh, on this elevation. And you'll also note as well we had three windows in the hallway, which would provide provide natural light. Into the um, into the unit, the the third and final attempt to create some privacy and and um, some separation between our project and the neighbor to to make them feel comfortable was we actually eliminated the third floor window, and on the first and second floor windows we changed those from clear glass to frosted glass. So this is again this is the original elevation along that eastern or oh, rendering showing that corner and the eastern elevation, and this is the proposed change. So you can see here, we, we've used, a, 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 it's a little hard to see because there's not any shadow play here, but the white, the white building uh, on the third floor sets back by that distance of 18 inches, which enabled us to wrap a darker gray stucco at the corner, reintroduce a, a, a more fine grain residential brick material um, facing the neighbor at a two story scale, which actually matches the pop outs and the balconies and garages along our southern elevation. So that material kind of replicates. And then to introduce a standing uh, standing seam metal um, roof element here, which kind of promotes a two story with a roof scale setting back to the white stucco of the overall building beyond. You can also see here, um, our previous rendering did not accurately, I think, uh, address or, or communicate the relationship of the adjacent property line and the landscaping. And so here, what we've done this now, uh, one, of the, one of the mitigation techniques with the neighbor, um, and the finish is yet to be determined, I think, but one of the mitigation techniques that we agreed with the neighbor was to rebuild their fence line to give them a, a greater sense of security along here. So that, that could be wood, that could be CMU block. We need to work through those, uh, refine those details with the neighbor on what they'd be happy with. But also you can see here the landscaping that we've got. So there's actually a layer of buffering also scaling up of, of uh, linear, tall linear landscaping elements in between our property line and the building itself. So I think, you know, we really went, uh, we, we really tried to not just listen to the planning commission's comments on, on uh, how our building was relating to the neighbor, but reached out to that neighbor as well to ensure that what we were doing was acceptable to them and, and, and really mitigated any concerns they had on the scale and privacy um, that they would have in their backyard to our project. The second issue also seen in this elevation, uh, I'm gonna go back again one just to show you the before. 
Previously, you could see the on the left hand side, you could see the lower level planter that we had on the southern property line. And you can see that the uh, the front of our buildings was essentially hardscape because we've got a, a we've got our vehicular entry, which is also our fire truck access. And we have our pedestrian um, pathway in front of these buildings. But by pushing the building back two feet and eliminating the planter on the left side, we're not eliminating, but relocating that plantable space up against the building, we were able to add a considerable layer of softness to the project by having um, three foot wide planters in between every garage and then having some linear planters that actually go back into the project as well. So I think there's, a, there's been an intent, um, intentional effort to soften the building and to bring a lot of low level soft landscaping elements to soften the pedestrian scale, but also some taller planting elements, which would allow the building to kind of scale up from the landscaping to the two story to the three story scale. Um, this view here looks specifically at that Eastern elevation relationship to the neighbor. You can see our five foot setback. You can see the planting that inhabits that, that in between space. And you can see, again, it's a little tough because of the shadowing here, but you can see the way the building scales up at two story with the standing seam setback and then sets into our third story scale beyond. Um, it's a tough angle, a tough space to give you a rendering of, but we, we did our best here to communicate how the building scales back. Um, I think these are, these are a couple of slides which are left over from the previous. Uh, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through those. Um, and I'm going to zoom into this slide again. I, I know I don't have much time, so I don't want it to be too long, but I wanted to show you the, one of the, one of the, uh, incentives I believe we're requesting is an, is a slight encroachment into the 30 foot, uh, the building envelope plane. So I wanted to show you the very slight encroachment on that Eastern elevation and kind of show again, how that, how that scales up, uh, to the two story, if I can get my PDF to slide over, sorry. Come on now. Okay. Okay. My apologies. My uh, my computer is not allowing me to move over to to highlight that area for you. But anyway, so I'm going to just zoom out of that so I can wrap up. Anyway, this little orange triangle here in the corner is the is the slight encroachment on that. Um. I don't recall at our previous presentation, you, uh, you may have asked for materials. Um, so I, I put up here our material board. Um, we've got a combination of different tones of stucco finish. Um, obviously the fine grain texture of brick being a very residential robust material uh, and then highlighting that with some different wood highlights and metal uh, railings and so on. And then that's our final view of the project kind of looking at it from the, from the west looking back towards our project. So I, I hope that those revisions have addressed the Planning Commission's concerns and I'm obviously here to answer any questions that, that you may have. And our landscape architect is here also in case you have specific landscape related questions for him. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, we'll go into the public comment portion of the meeting. Should I stop uh, sharing my screen? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go into the public comments, and we do have at least one speaker. Um, is that Christine Gomez? No. It's not. Uh, okay. uh, Mr. Fulton, you mentioned there was one speaker. What? Who was that? Sorry, yeah, it, it was uh, Christine Gomez. It's... Um... Lee Gomez's daughter, she's the owner, or <clears throat> he's the owner of the property that has the most impact of our project and um, might be running into some technical issues. I'm actually just messaging, messaging her real quick in case uh, can't figure it out, but. Um, okay, we'll, we'll look for her name. Are, were there any other speakers uh, who wanted to speak on this item? And uh, staff, do we know? I don't know, just want to. That was just the one. There was just one, one. one speaker. Okay. Um, we'll, I'll keep the public uh, comment period open, but we will start discussion. And we, when we see her name come up on the board, uh, we'll, we'll let her in. Um, Thank you. 
So I would, we'll start now the Planning Commission discussion on the item and I'm just gonna start, uh, not in my discussion portion, but I just wanted to thank the, the applicant for reaching out to the neighbor. Um, I thought that was a great move on your part. Uh, I saw their support. So I, I know me for one, but I know the rest of the commission really appreciate that effort. So thank you for that. So with that, let's get into discussion. I'll go in alphabetical order. We'll start with Commissioner Austin. Doug, you're muted. Make sure there. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate the effort. I'm glad that you've talked to the neighbor. That the neighbor um, is is uh, supportive. Uh, I must admit, I'm I'm a little lost on what you did on that end, um, where it's only coming in a couple of feet, 18 inches to two feet, and and it's not your renderings don't show the context of the neighbor. So I'm kind of struggling trying to visualize that impact. Obviously. It's an effort to do something, um, but it's hard for me to get a grasp of it. I am curious to see what Commissioner Atsuji thinks about the landscape. The architecture, you know, I was not that opposed to the architecture before, um, but I just, you know, look, if the, if the neighbor's happy with it, that gesture, that means something. I just can't get a handle on this 18 inches and the, the little facade that you did on that one side, how it really works. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stop there and listen to my other commissioners for now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Austin. Commissioner Boomhauer. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna add a lot to this. The, I, I'm really happy to see you guys reached out to the neighbor. I know that was a, a major concern of the, of the planning commissioners, and I think you guys have dealt with that uh very thoughtfully and very well so i'm gonna have no problem supporting this in fact i'll go ahead and kick us off with a motion to uh a motion implementing staff's recommendations second okay thank you we have a a motion by commissioner boomhauer for approval of the project and we have a second by vice chair whalen uh, commissioner granowitz yeah, I'm in agreement with Commissioner Boomhauer, um, but I do want to wait to hear what Commissioner Atsuji has to say about the landscaping. Okay, thank you. And I think we all do. But before we do, I'd like to go to Commissioner Moden. I have nothing further to add than what they said. I'm looking forward to Commissioner Atsuji's comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Commissioner Atsuji, it's all on you. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, just, just a disclosure, um, uh, I am quite familiar with this area, uh, uh, so uh, just, just as a disclosure, uh, especially on the slope situation. Um, starting with additional landscaping, I think they did a very good job. What I'd like to do is if Mr. Grove could uh, explain the plant materials used, I think there was a question from uh, Commissioner Whalen in regards to some of the plant materials. So if you can just give us a quick overview of the plant material list. I tried to look at the plants, but they were such a small scale that I didn't want to make a mistake. But what I saw in the planning legend was quite acceptable with uh, a lot of vertical elements uh, and a lot of evergreen that would really soften and uh, complement, especially that uh, east side, and I did see the comment from the neighbor uh, complimenting the applicant uh, for his action and uh, meeting with him. So if the landscape architect could explain just the plant materials that were added or revised. Yes, sir. Commissioner Otsuji, thank you very much. My name is Brian Grove. Um, regarding the plants that were added uh, to the frontage of the, the property there at the frontage of the buildings were the, uh, the Italian cypress and, um, you know, obviously to get some height as um, was previously explained for the Vulcan scale, um, as well as the ground plane for the pedestrian entrances, we have um, an evergreen bush, which is the, the dwarf um, Raphaelepis. Um, the slope was requested down on Marina Boulevard to be covered as well. And so I believe that was dictated to be a Baccarus. 
um, which we have put on there. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in favor, the backrest will work, but I'm a little concerned of its longevity. So if it was, you know, if it was up to me, I might, might request an acacia, a dwarf acacia that would be much more hardier um, and vigorous to grow on that slope. That slope is a very tough condition. But um, other than that, um, you know, and then changing out the palm trees along the Western property line there at the top, um, we had changed those out to a, a, a Tristania or a Brisbane box. Um, so that's, that's the changes that we had incorporated from the, from the previous comments from the commission. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grove. Um, yes, question to you, uh, going to the Northern uh, section of the property, I guess we would probably be the Northwest corner. Uh, there are some areas that could uh, accommodate some additional plant material. And I'm sure there's a reason why they weren't shown in those areas, especially at the, uh, you know where the uh, access is into the garage areas on both sides and on that corner, uh, there wasn't any landscape shown. There, there was very, there, there was some shown on the, uh, uh, the southern side of that entrance, but on the northern side, there was nothing. And I was um, wondering if there was anything possible that you would be able to add there. I know that's a fire access also. Yes, correct. Uh, fire access. Now, are you talking, um, just so we're clear, um, I showed two double doors there on the south side of, of that unit. Um, and I believe that is where we have utilities coming in, whether it's phone or Cox or cable. Um, is that the area you're talking about? Yes. Um, Polly, do you, I'm not terribly familiar with the, what's exactly going on there, but I believe we need that open for access. Is that correct? Is Polly still here? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still here, correct. Um, that's so the, the the challenge on that intersection uh, or that that location, and I'm happy to bring up the site plan again if you don't mind me sharing my screen. Thank you. Okay. Let me just do that. Um, so, Commissioner Atsui, this is this is the area I believe you're referring to. So the challenge that we have here is we've got utilities. All of our utilities are coming into the project in the arcs of the turning radius, the hammerhead turning radius of the fire trucks. So we, we can't really plant in either of these areas here. And in front of this building, we've got the double uh, garage door opening directly onto this. And you can see what's highlighted in orange is the required open fire turning space. So we, in, in that particular space, we, we could not provide any softening or any planting because of the, the congested utilities the, and, and then the two entries, the pedestrian entry and the vehicular entry into this end unit. And then when we get to the end here, where, where the orange stops, right behind here, it's a little hard to see, but from, from the corner until uh, just inside of this kind of designated tree grate area is one of the um, uh, decorative um, etched glass historic screens and it was staff's um, direction I believe that we could not put any trees or any landscaping directly behind that because it would it would uh, um, limit the visibility of those screening elements so what we had to do was actually locate the trees along here you can see we've got a couple at the end and then we've got two we had to lo locate those outside of those areas of the the etched decorative historic glass panels so it's that kind of that whole end of the project is quite limiting in how much softness we could add which is why we focused our softness on the on the eastern portion of the site okay thank you and, and you know i think you did a, a good job uh in the in those areas um what i'd like for you to do is uh, possibly agree to looking at some planters in that area, if possible, to just to soften it a little bit. Once you uh, get into the contract documents, they would be portable, movable. So hopefully you would be able to do that. I would, I would make that part of the, my recommendation uh, of this motion. Happy to do uh, so. Um, on the revision of the trees, I'm, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, from palm trees to a more canopy tree that will give uh, a better softness to uh, that elevation. One of the questions I have, I guess, both for staff and the applicant is public view. Uh, where did that come from? I mean, uh, 
I, I don't understand that you can't block public view. Is there is there an easement through there or am I missing something? There is not a, uh, an easement on here, but when you actually come into the site um, from Lieta and uh, Tonopah, you can actually see all the way to the ocean and all the way downtown. So the design of the building on the site was actually stepped back to keep those views towards the ocean and downtown to be remained. So any changes to the landscape, it did not block that. So uh, one of the community um, concerns on here that I brought up in the very beginning was regarding keeping the views and not, um, not getting rid of their views from the public right away. And there's not an easement or restriction. So, so it sounds like the applicant worked it out with the property owners to preserve views as much as possible, but it looks like there's no code requirement to preserve those views, but it seems like it worked out. Correct. So it was to accommodate the neighborhood more than anything else. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, one of my major concerns uh, was offside of that slope. So it's good to hear that there will be some ground cover uh, 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 added to that uh, slope on Marina Boulevard. Uh, is there any possibility of cleaning up the other slope or is that out of uh, uh, the context, uh, context of this project? Are you referring to the slope on the uh, adjacent the Southern property line? Yes. That uh, That's privately owned property. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, you'll be able to talk them into making it more accommodating or <laughs> better looking than what it is. Uh, so, but I appreciate uh, the one on Marina Boulevard. That was the worst of it. You know, one side of it was uh, just gunited slope and the other was just full of weeds. So uh, right now you show back Chris uh, and you were thinking about Acacia. I would stay away from the Acacia uh, and maybe you could look at a lower, ground cover like uh, uh, there's one uh, Caprosma Reapens, uh, there's a low growing one there that won't uh, block the view of, uh, of the, uh, the fencing that you have up above. So I'll leave that up to uh, uh, your consultant and, uh, and the city staff in regards to coming up with a, a material that uh, will enhance that area. Commissioner, but, uh, this is Jeff Peterson. Just to clarify that the gunite portion of that slope will remain. It's this, and the, it's the portion that is not gunite in the public right of way that will be landscaped. We cannot get away from the um, gunite um, to remove the gunite. Uh, I understand that. I wish you could, but I understand. Uh, there's other issues involved in that if you did remove the gunite. So I completely understand where you're at or where the city is at on that. But uh, uh, it's been a quite an improvement, especially on the elevation. So to me, acceptable to what they have done and it uh, meets you know, what I was concerned with in regards to uh, the project itself from a landscape standpoint. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Otsuji. I, real quick question before I turn it over to Vice Chair Manuelan. Um, I, I ran into a buzzsaw on a project with the Vista Fire Department on the Italian Cypress um, because of its, its flammability. And Commissioner Otsuji, any thoughts on that at all? Well, that's, I guess that's the first that I've heard of that on a Capressus. Uh, but I believe, and uh, correct, correct me if I'm off, but uh, there's a combination of both the cypress and the podocarpus uh, as the vertical element uh, on this project. But I, I've never heard uh, of it being a fire hazard. I have neither. It came from a, the fire marshal there, so obviously he's not a landscaper, so I'll, I'll let that go. But, yeah. but I agree those, these changes are good. So. Uh, Vice Chair Whalen. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I want to commend the applicant too for the efforts they took to improve the project. Um, one point I would make is if you're uh, if you're thinking of using the backrus on the slopes, uh, particularly facing Morena, uh, I've used coyote brush 
before in difficult soils and slope and it works fine. It, it grows slowly, but it does get leggy after a while and needs to be, you know, uh, maintained after some years. Uh, who will be taking care of the uh, slope landscaping? Applicant. Mike, I think that's a question for you, Mike. Um, well, I assume we'll uh, have some sort of HOA in, in place that will uh, uh, have us maintain it. Staff, do you want to comment on that at all? Yes, maintenance of the adjacent right of way is a responsibility of the property owner. Okay, because uh, the it'll, it'll look nice, but you just got to keep after it after five, six years. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I start, did the caller ever come on? No. So, so she actually came on. She actually said she never got a phone number or anything to call in. They, she applied and she was waiting for an email for a number. And she said she never got a call, how, how to actually call in. So um, and through the log and I didn't either. Sorry, well. Okay. But she's listening. She's texting me. She's saying like, I, I just don't know how to get in. That's all. Do you want to give her that? Go ahead and give that number out. And while we're doing that, I'll, I'll just uh, start my comments. I, I concur with the other, my other fellow commissioners. Uh, I, I'm really appreciative that the applicant took the time to go out and work out the issues with the neighbor. Um, uh, as Commissioner Austin mentioned, uh, I, I, I didn't understand completely uh, those changes. I couldn't get my arms totally around it, but the fact that uh, you worked it out with the neighbors, they're happy. Uh, that makes me feel a whole lot better. So I, I can definitely support the motion. Um, and what I'd like to do, and really that's all my comments, uh, but why don't I, we just give a minute to let her come on and we, we wanna let everyone who wants to speak, speak on this. So I do have the information available for the call-in uh, on this item. If the caller could please call 1-669-254-5252. The meeting ID number is 160-061-9016. The passcode is 492724. And PJ, I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that? Because I know Thank if it was me, I'd be scrambling to write it down. <laughs> sure, I will repeat that again. That's a great suggestion. The phone number to call in on this item, that one caller that uh, had requested it, 1-669-254. 5252. The meeting ID number is 1600619016. The passcode is 492724. So if you call that number, you will be entered into the meeting room. We will identify you by the last four digits of your phone number and ask you to unmute you and ask you to speak. And you can do that by hitting star six at the prompt. Um, so uh, I saw something just happen over there. Did she call in? No. Chair Hoffman, this is Commissioner Bimhauer. While yes. we're waiting on her, um, Commissioner Otsuji had made a recommendation about a change to the motion, and I want to make sure that we don't lose track of that. Um, I'm I'm happy to, to amend the motion. I just want to make sure we're getting the language correct. Yes, and I, I've got that noted, um, and I'll make sure that we go. In fact, uh, did she still not on? No. Okay, we're, we're just going to have to proceed. We'll, st we'll still wait for her if she wants to call. But, but yeah, let's going back to uh, Commissioner Otsuji's um, add-on condition to the motion. Uh, what I heard was he would like to see planters added where possible uh, in the void area that we discussed uh, during the, uh, his comments. Um, and it would be my thought that the motion would basically have the applicant work with the staff to provide planners in that area to the degree possible. Um, Mr. Otsuji, can you clarify, does that 
summarize it well, or do you want to change that? Uh, that summarizes it very well. Okay, and I under the uh, motion maker, Commissioner Boomhauer, is okay with that. Is the second vice chair Whalen okay with that? He's nodding his head yes for the record. Um, and are there any commissioners who have a problem with that amendment? Okay. So can I, can I make a comment on that? I, I think Commissioner Atsui also mentioned that those planters could be movable if that if that was uh, acceptable to staff when we get into the documentation phase. That's correct. Because I, I would like to, I, I agree, I would love to put some planters, but I, I, I think including the word, word movable there um, because of our fire truck access, I think is important to include if that's possible. Okay, uh, anybody have a problem with that? And seeing as none, so we'll make sure that that's included in the motion. Uh, did we get our speaker? We, we do. have two speakers. I did leave the public comment period open. I think it's probably, um, I think they're in support, but we do have a motion on the floor. I know it's a little bit late, but let's let them speak. And who is our first one? Christina, 0426. This is, this is Christina. So Christina, if you could go ahead. I did leave the public comment period open, I think. Oops. Christina, mute your uh, your background devices and, and go ahead and speak when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Please begin. Hello, uh, my name is Christine Gomez and I and my father, Leandro Gomez, live at 1404 Laida Street and would like to speak on agenda 512890. Uh, first, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Chairperson William Hoffman for ensuring that the adjacent property's privacy was considered before approving this development last month. So thank you so much, William. As such, it resulted in the developer, Mike Fulton, my father and myself meeting at our home. And Mike had the opportunity to see firsthand the privacy impact on our privacy, on our property. And he made some generous adjustments, which we totally appreciate and some promises to alleviate some of those issues, as well as giving back our view of Mission Bay, which is awesome. Thank you, Mike. And we know and we understand that the 13 units will cause guest parking issues and an increase in traffic and noise on our quiet dead end street. And of course, we believe that the six units would probably had been more manageable and palatable to our neighborhood but in, unfortunately, in an effort to create more housing in big cities like San Diego, the state of California has created a hodgepodge of multiple home units sandwiched in between single family homes, which has created somewhat of ugly neighborhoods and overcrowding of our streets and resources. And we see this happening now into our neighborhood at Bay Park. However, after seeing Mr. Fuller's plans, we believe that his plans are of high quality and increase the value of the property now, as well as the property in the surrounding neighborhood and our property as well. We hope, we hope that during the construction phase, the developer will be sensitive to the dirt, noise and dis disruption it will cause, but we do look forward to, to that property being developed and we thank you so much for working with our neighborhood and working closely with me and my father. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, William. And thank you for the comments. Uh, we do have, there's no other speakers. So thank you for finally getting on. Sorry about the technical issues. Um, I want to now close the public testimony portion, but I would like to turn it back to any commissioners who have any comments or have any second thoughts based on that testimony. And seeing as none, we do have a motion on the floor uh, by Commissioner Boomhauer, seconded by Vice Chair Whalen, uh, to approve the project with an added condition that the applicant work with staff to add planters, movable planters in those uh, uh, the void areas that were discussed, and I think staff, uh, you know what we're talking about. 
Yes. So with that, let's go through and take a vote. Please say a or aye or nay on Commissioner Austin. Aye. Commissioner Boomhauer. Aye. Commissioner Granowitz. Aye. Commissioner Moden. Aye. Commissioner Otsuji. Aye. Vice Chair Whalen. Aye. And Chairman Hoffman is an aye. That passes unanimously. And thank you again to the applicant. Um, and we will now, uh, you guys, if you'd like, can now get off the applicants I'm talking about. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will go to thank item you. two, but we're going to take. You can wait a minute. I got to Yeah, we're going to take about two minutes to technically get everything ready for staff presentation. So please uh, hold on just for a couple of minutes. Can everyone hear me? Okay, thank you. Okay. Are we back or no? Okay, uh, we are back uh, and we will go now to uh, item number two. This is the 2020 San Diego Municipal Code update, and we will have a remote presentation by Renee. And please begin whenever you are ready and don't forget to share your screen. Great, thanks so much. Um, good morning, commissioners. My name is Renee Mezzo. I'm a project manager in the planning department and I'm here to present the 2020 update to the Municipal Code and Local Coastal Program. I'm going to share my screen.
Okay, can everyone see? See the title slide? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so let me make sure this is working. There we go. Um, so um, just to kind of give you a little background, this is the first year with our new process improvements. Um, our process improvements included um, creating a predictable schedule for these annual comprehensive updates. We, um, the new improvements also provide structure and certainty for quicker delivery of reforms. And we're using um, better technology to track and keep the information consistent. And I'm happy to report that after last year's 12th code update phase one, two, and three of over a hundred items, um, this process has uh, allowed for a much smoother um, consistent process. Um, so um, I'm really happy uh, as how things are going for this year. So this year's comprehensive update includes 46 uh, items. Um, if you remember last year, there were over 100. Um, half of them uh, currently this year are corrections. Um, there are 17 regulatory reforms. There's one new regulation and one item um, to comply with state law. So I wanted to start with the regulatory reforms. We're going to start with the downtown center city and gas lamp um, regulations that Brad Richter is gonna go into. And then we're gonna go into the airport overlay zone repeal, which Alex Frost, senior planner for the planning department will um, present. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna keep my screen and then Brad's gonna go ahead and speak to the next slide. Brad, you ready? Yes, thank you, Renee. Um, Brad Richter. Bravo. Deputy Director of the Urban Division. Uh, we had bringing forward a number of amendments that affect the downtown community plan area. Uh, they are guided by the Center City Plan District Ordinance and the Gas Lamp Quarter Plan District Ordinance. So in addition to corrections and cleanup items, we have seven significant changes. Uh, I'll go through those now. The first is to allow adjoining properties that are not owned by the same person to share FAR limits and land use compliance. We used to be able to achieve this through a center city development permit, but we eliminated those last year. And a lot of projects can now go on a ministerial basis, but we wanted to preserve the right for two adjoining properties to comply with our zoning regulations by tying them together in a recorded covenant. The second amendment is to allow previously conforming uses and structures to expand up to 10% by right Currently, they can expand up to 100% through a discretionary neighborhood use permit. This would allow small additions to be ministerial. The third amendment is to require that above grade parking structures to have level floor plates adjacent to any public right of way to allow for future conversion of the garage. As parking demands change over time and more and more developments downtown have higher intensities on smaller sites, we're seeing a lot more above grade parking and podium structures. And we want to be ensure that in the future that if parking demands do go down that we're able to convert those garages easily. Uh, the fourth amendment is to allow outdoor dining on site by ride similar to sidewalk cafes subject to a 350 square foot or 50 person limit. Otherwise, you would have to get a discretionary neighborhood use permit. The next to last amendment is to eliminate the 500 foot height limit in downtown. Currently, uh, the FAA restricts uh, heights in the downtown area, mostly to a 500 foot height limit, but there are some areas of downtown where they've allowed slightly higher structures. So we don't wanna artificially limit that height limit when the FAA is comfortable that it does not create any flight hazard to Lindbergh Field. And the last amendment is to eliminate the minimum parking requirements in the gas lamp quarter. Uh, the National Historic District, as you know, is a very popular dining and entertainment district a lot of pedestrian activity and we're trying to minimize vehicle and pedestrian conflicts. So we're eliminating any minimum parking requirements in there and establishing parking uh, maximums in there. That's it for our amendments. Thanks, Brad. Um, I'd like to introduce Alex Frost with the planning department who is going to discuss the um, amendments to the airport overlay zones. Alex, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, so if you want to just say next slide and I'll um, move the slide along. 
Good morning, commissioners. My name is Alex Frost, senior planner with the planning department. I'll start with a quick introduction and some background followed by a summary of major proposed changes. Next slide. Next. The main objectives of this items are to implement the airport land use compatibility plans for San Diego International Airport, Naval Outlying Landing Field, Imperial Beach, and Naval Air Station, North Island. Second, to repeal the airport approach overlay zone and airport environs overlay zone. The existing sections are no longer consistent with both the Caltrans Air California Airport Land Use Planning Handbook and the current LUCP documents. And third, refine, clarify, and improve the existing airport land use compatibility overlay zone. Next. There are seven airport influence areas uh, that intersect the city of San Diego boundary uh, in yellow. Next. Each airport uh, has its own airport land use compatibility plan that gives standards and policies for new development. There are four compatibility factors, noise, safety, airspace, and overflight. Next. So today we'll be focusing on the three uh, airports uh, highlighted below. Next. The airport influence area is the planning area of the LUCP. AIA is the area in which current and projected future airport related noise, safety, airspace protection, or overflight factors layers may significantly affect land use or necessitate restriction on land use. So this influence area covers approximately 60% of the city. About 30,000 acres are within review area one and 112,000 acres are in review area two. Next. Now zooming into San Diego International, review area one in red is the combination of the 60 dB CNEL noise contour, the outer boundary of all safety zones and the airspace threshold sighting surfaces. All policies and standards apply within review area one. Review area two in orange is the combination of airspace protection and overflight boundaries beyond review area one. Only airspace protection and overflight policies and standards apply. Next. The purpose of the noise contours is to minimize the noise impacts from airport operation for a new development. It provides policies and standards to regulate different uses. Next. There are 27 neighborhood specific safety zones for San Diego International. Safety zone regulates use, density, and intensity as compatible, conditionally compatible, and incompatible. Next. Airspace protection boundary regulates heights to avoid an object or condition that would compromise flight safety as determined by the FAA. And this is the area in purple. Next. Threshold sighting surfaces uh, define critical airspace that must be protected for safe approaches to runways. Um, it provides specific height limitation for takeoff and landing of aircrafts. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, finally, overflight notification agreement must be recorded with the Office of County Recorder for any new dwelling units within the overflight area. Now I will move on to the summary of proposed uh, major changes. Next. So this table provides an overview of the new compatibility language in the airport land use compatibility overlay zones. Uh, so San Diego International includes all, all four factors, while uh, North Imperial Beach contains three factors and Naval Air Station North Island includes two factors uh, integrated into the overlay zone. Next. For noise compatibility, uh, changes are made to streamline applicability to parcels with multiple noise contours 
to 50% of the gross floor area. Currently, there are multiple methods between different LECPs, such as MCS Miramar, Brownfield, and Montgomery Gibbs to determine this applicability. So we're um, streamlining to the latest standard. Next. For safety compatibility, three major changes are proposed. Uh, number one, the change the maximum dwelling unit cap from 20 dwelling unit acres to 60 dwelling unit per acre within the Miramar, MCS Miramar uh, LUCP transition zone. Um, second, to boost allowable FAR by 20% for non-residential projects in Brownfield and Montgomery Gibbs Airport, uh, which is currently allowed by the LUCPs. Next. Uh, and for a San Diego International Airport, a new section for mixed use projects seeking a density bonus. Um, so for any applicant requesting a uh, density bonus for a mixed use development, uh, specifically in safety zones 3NE Uptown, 3NW Peninsula and Midway Pacific Highway, and 4W Peninsula and Ocean Beach, the residential density limits uh, in the tables uh, do not apply. Uh, the total number of proposed residential dwelling units shall not exceed the maximum of non-residential intensity limits. So um, just for a background, there's two ways to calculate dwelling units per acre for residential and then people per acre for non-residential. So this would allow the calculation using people per acre uh, for any projects uh, requesting density bonus. And this accommodates uh, you know, the need for smaller units uh, in, in, the, in the TPAs and close to downtown. Next. This concludes my presentation. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the rest of the items I'm gonna go through are the rest of the regulatory reforms. Um, I'm gonna just speak briefly to each of these. And then if we have questions, um, we can go back. The number in parentheses is corresponding to the item number on the matrix that was part of your, um, was an attachment to the report. So the first item is the vehicular area. This would revise vehicular use areas to provide canopy form and evergreen species instead of palm trees. The next one is to add additional language for appeals of emergency actions and of the notice of right to appeal on the city's website. We're also um, revising the timing for filing an appeal from 10 days to five business days. Uh, the next one is the setbacks. Uh, this allows an applicant the option between zero and 10 feet for specific setbacks, not zero or 10 feet. Uh, and this also allows for additional flexibility. The lot coverage, is, we are removing the 50% lot coverage for those specific zones in order to achieve higher dense developments and to avoid using type five construction uh, to achieve six or seven stories. The calculation for, um, gross floor area, we're revising this calculation diagram to clarify the measurement from finished floor to the finished floor or roof elevation. Um, this, um, there was also a slight change in the draft language that I sent the, um, a memo to yesterday regarding this one. Um, the, the next one is the amendment uh, for removing the floor area ratio reservation for parking. This requirement uh, reflects current development trends and provides greater flexibility in the utilization and distribution of allowable area ratio. Uh, the temporary storage, we are um, providing regulations to require a temporary use permit of portable on-demand storage uh, within the public right-of-way. The next one eliminates the requirement to provide evidence that the commercial space has been vacant for six months or more to allow for interim ground floor residential uses in certain zones. The next one allows light wells um, to not be included in the overall height for subterranean areas. And we're clarifying the coastal height um, that it also needs to comply with zoning height requirements. The next one, we are adding recreational amenities to exemptions from a development permit within the public right-of-way. Uh, 
A recreational amenity uh, is defined as any improvement that provides recreational value to residents or visitors, and that enhances pedestrian or bicycle travel experience. Previously conforming parking um, may only remain idle for two years, um, which uh, given the current state of the economy, we are revising the code to allow previously conforming parking to remain idle for five years instead of two. Next one, we're adding language to increase, um, to allow an increase from two years to three years for fee deferral agreements entered into for construction permits issued be between March, 2020 and March, 2022. Um, this um, amendment rose uh, because of COVID-19. Um, the next one is the moderate income uh, which recently got approved. We are um, removing the requirement to maximize the density bonus to 50% for projects of 50 units or less um, and add three incentives to incentivize smaller scale development within this income category. We are revising the definition to placemaking to include eating and drinking, allow utilization of private parking lots for outdoor dining and to allow bicycle parking to replace vehicle parking. And this would be for private property um, only. The next one is uh, revising the point in time that the development impact, regional transportation, congestion improvement program, and civic and housing impact fees are paid. Um, we are removing the building permit issuance threshold and we're, we are revising it to pay at the time of the same time you have to pay your building permit fees. And this one was also um, some clarifications in the draft language um, were part of the memo to the planning commission um, that was put out yesterday. So that concludes the regulatory reforms. Um, the new regulation um, is we are adding the, a new separately regulated commercial use for adult daycare. Um, we're allowing it as a limited use in zones similar to childcare. Um, Staff has found that this use has been coming up more frequently, um, and there it was kind of hard to fit in where it where it where it goes. So we're um, adding this new use, and then the compliance with state law. Um, in order to comply with Assembly Bill 1381, the term organic material is added to all code sections that reference refuse and recycling material, and a new section is added related to the construction and demolition debris and an update to the storage requirements for organic material. As part of uh, these amendments, uh, two rezones are also proposed to implement amendments to the Center City Plan District. The first rezone is at fire station number four at the corner of J Street and 8th Avenue within the downtown community plan. We're rezoning from public facilities district to the ballpark mixed use district. The second rezone is um, fire station number two on Cedar Street within the downtown community plan area from public facilities to employment residential district. Um, the figure that, that you see to your right was actually updated in the, in the last code update, the 12th code update phase two. Um, so now we're coming in to actually um, get the ordinance approved for um, the actual rezoning. We held um, four public virtual workshops, uh, one in June and three in July to discuss all the regulatory reforms and garner feedback. Um, and they went um, very well. There, they were, um, there were a lot of people participating, which was great. And the Community Planners Committee approved all the items except the notice of right to appeal the environmental determination um, and a previously conforming use extension. Um, they took another motion then to deny both of those items. And um, just as note, the previously conforming use extension um, subsequently was, was deleted from this um, amendment. And so it is not part of um, your recommendation today. And then the downtown community planning group unanimous, unanimously approved all of the center city and gas lamp amendments, um, which Brad went over earlier. So that concludes my report. Um, we are recommending that you recommend the city council to approve the 2020 code update as presented. And um, we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay.
So are we unmuted? Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to now, before we open it up for public comments, ask if any of the planning commissioners have clarification questions. Uh, let's start with Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mezzo, could, and it's actually probably Mr. Richter, can we talk a little bit about the reason on the fire stations and what the purpose is there? Sure. Uh, these zones, the uh, public facility zone was a new zone we created in 2012. Uh, these sites had been purchased by the redevelopment agency and due to the dissolution of redevelopment, uh, we were concerned that the state might force the sale of properties that were intended for fire stations. And so we created the new zone and we rezoned the properties. Subsequent to that, the state did allow the redevelopment agency to transfer those properties over to the city proper. And so this, these actions are just returning them to the neighborhood zoning that existed before 2012. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, I spoke with the Ethics Commission on this issue uh, yesterday, just to be sure that I was on solid ground. He said, listen in, and if you discover along the way, you think you may have a conflict, so then just raise your hand and bow out. And that's what I'm going to do, because after thinking about all of these ordinance, um, it could, uh, could involve a conflict. So I thought I'd better play it safe. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Austin has recused, so he will not be participating on this item. Uh, are there any other clarification questions? Uh, Commissioner Granowitz. What heartburn did the CPC have over the previous conforming rights issue? Um, so there, um, the reason why they denied that is there are some uses that they thought they didn't want to um, return. Um, so they, they, they just thought that um, there's some uses that shouldn't go back into the neighborhood. So to allow more time um, for them to try to go back into the neighborhood, um, they didn't agree with that. Could you speak to what those conditions were? I know that there have been issues with things like automotive paint kinds of um, facilities that communities have been trying to get a lot um, get rid of? Yeah, um, one that was uh, specifically brought up was an adult bookstore on El Cajon Boulevard, I think. <laughs> but nothing that with toxic um, elements involved with them. Yeah, that didn't get brought up. Okay. It was just the adult bookstore um, use. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah. Okay, are there any other clarification? Yes, Commissioner Moden. Can you um, give me a little bit more information on what the, the fee structure modifications are? I know there's the DIF deferral, um, but when I was reading through the modified language, it sounded as though um, there are some things that you don't have to pay at permit issuance that you have from permit issuance until your first inspection. Is that all fees? Is it a certain portion of them? Obviously, you can defer your dip, so I'm trying to understand what, what that was referencing. Um, sure. So the deferral, uh, and, and Heidi, maybe if you could speak to this as well, um, the deferral was just for the development impact fees. And then the change in the process for the when you pay um, the diff fees and the civic fee and um, well, there was one other the CIP fee um, that one will just be extended or just be allowed to be paid at the time of building permit the same time you pay your building permits versus at issuance. Does that clarify? Yes, there was revised language that was sent to us that said you could be paid between permit issuance, but prior to your first inspection. That's what I thought I had read. Oh, Tom, did you want to speak to that one? Were you Actually, raising your I, hand? I was saying goodbye to somebody, but yes, I oh. will. So <laughs> um, one of the longstanding complaints has been that for the diff, because the code requires it, we're asking applicants to pay that fee prior to building permit issuance. However, the other fees that DSD charges, they do charge after the actual issuance date. 
So this code modification aligns those two sets of fees. Okay. It's typically a difference of just a couple of days. It's just a um, clarification to the code to make sure that we can um, collect all fees at one point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other clarification questions? Uh, I don't see anybody. So let's go into the uh, public comments. Um, and yeah, let's start with, uh, we have a call-in user, it says. So do we have that person on the line? Okay. Uh, we don't have an identification, but I think we have the last four numbers of their phone number. No, nope, we don't. So uh, if you're here to speak on this item, uh, go ahead and speak up and identify yourself. Yeah, thank you. This is Ann Fagey, and I chair the Community Forest Advisory Board. Uh, changes in the tree-related codes are long overdue. A group of urban foresters, arborists, and landscape architects has reviewed the code and identified major issues with palms, planting points, infill, and code compliance. The revisions considered today follow our recommendations to remove palms from approved street tree and vehicle use area landscapes. Palms contribute little to tree canopy, shade, or stormwater management and are expensive to maintain. The remaining tree issues will be submitted again in 2021. Most developments are now infill where existing buildings are leveled or greatly altered, trees removed, the built footprint expanded, and little space allocated to landscaping and trees. Urban green space is disappearing and heat retaining buildings and pavement are replacing the green. Pro projects should not be built with virtually no setback from the property line, no backyards and no green space in neighborhoods many of whom are already park poor. In the point system, larger containers are assigned more points. This is counter to good tree science, as smaller containerized nursery tree stock adapts much better to the site. The points need to be assigned to trees that will provide more shade, carbon sequestration, and other benefits. Tree maintenance requirements need to be strengthened in the code and penalties for noncompliance imposed and collected. Too many trees are over pruned and topped, reducing tree health, canopy, and shade. Trees die, especially in parking lots, and are never replaced. This is casually accepted by the city, but should not be the norm. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today, and we look forward to working with you again on tree-related revisions in 2021. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one other caller uh, who's Last four digits of the phone number are 0028. Uh, you want to admit her? She was up in the waiting room. Yep, he's in. Okay, please uh, go ahead. And again, the caller, your last four digits is the only way we can identify you is 0028. Uh, and please unmute yourself and please go ahead and speak. Good morning, commissioners. My name is DK Neal, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, whose mission is to make San Diego the best region to, <laughs> the best place to live and work. The chamber is pleased to support the proposed 2020 Municipal Code Update Package. The code update will streamline development and regulatory requirements, allowing for increased flexibility while also standardizing the framework. Particularly, new flexibility relating to parking requirements commercial ground floor vacancy, development impact fee payment schedules, and moderate income housing bonuses will be helpful to builders and increasing housing supply in the region. Additionally, the Chamber strongly supports item number 30, in which planning staff recommends changing the timing for filing appeals to environmental review from 10 days to five days. The Chamber would also like to commend planning department staff, specifically Renee Mezzo, for the countless hours and diligent work put into the code update. Staff has done a terrific job running workshops and organizing feedback. And with that in mind, the Chamber is pleased to offer our support for the Municipal Code update. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, can we just go up to that waiting room just to make sure there's no other speakers? Okay. Uh, and PJ, would you like to talk about the 
comments that were presented in by email. Yes, good morning, PJ Fitzgerald, Deputy Director of the Development Services Department. I just wanted to note for the record, we received a number of public comment and it has been distributed to the um, commission for their consideration at today's hearing. That includes John Becker, Phil Armstrong, and Faggy, who we heard from on the phone call in, also Kathleen Copley and John Brzezinski. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And so I'll close the public testimony portion of the project and let's go right to commissioners comments. Uh, I'd like to go in reverse order. Uh, we're gonna start with Vice Chair Whalen. Thank you. Uh, uh, nice job, staff. I'm gonna try and go through the questions I have, uh, comments I have as quickly as possible. So if I am going too fast, let me know. Um, I really like the uh, focus on placemaking on private property. And it's something we, we raised and talked about a little bit last week. So it would be nice to hear uh, once this is done, and I, I think we're all gonna move forward on it, uh, how it might be expanded or uh, updated to uh, broaden the use of outdoor spaces for uh, basically dining. Um, in the um, uh, I guess it's this is hard to go through on page six where you talk about the um, parking changes and that would be I guess you call it um, item 31 or change 31. Can you talk a little bit about uh, above grade parking levels being converted to residential uses in the future? We've talked about uh, in past projects where parking garages uh, had to be designed so they could accommodate re um, residences. And I didn't know that it costs more to have a parking garage convertible to residential. It was news to me, uh, but apparently they, they have to be designed differently. Uh, next one is on um, page two of 90. It's just a typo. Uh, I can work with staff on that. Uh, you're referring to a section G in uh, section 112.0310A2 when you really mean F. Uh, let's see, next one is on um, page uh, 10 of 90. <clears throat> which is section 129.0710 uh, item D4. I wanted to talk about the term of the public right of way permit not being allowed to go more than five years. We could talk about that. And it says it won't be eligible for an extension of time. If this outdoor dining thing catches on, I think people are gonna wanna be able to go more than five years. Um, I had a question on the following page, 11 of 90, uh, items eight and 10. I just wanna make sure I'm hearing this right, that um, uh, the placemaking or recreational amenity project shall not include commercial services, retail and assembly and entertainment uses. I'm not clear what that means as an accessory use. What does that mean? In that same page, item 10, it's, it's very frightening to see that you have to get a coastal development permit for uh, place making in the coastal overlay zone. Can we clarify that? Because anybody who has tried to get coastal permits knows what it's like. By the way, hi Renee, thanks for all you've done. Um, let's see, on page 24 of 90, very good start. Um, on the placemaking on private property. As you can see, there's a theme here in my comments. One, one thing that I didn't see in here was, it appears to me that to make this use of outdoor areas uh, 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 more permanent, we're gonna need to dis discuss safety because uh, one day a drunk is gonna come off the side of the road and go into one of these places. And I would like to discuss how we can assure safety. Is that through a, a consistent barrier or how's that work? 
let's see, going as fastly as I can. And I think I, that's all I have right now. I'd like to hear what everybody else thinks, but uh, nice work staff and I'll shut up. Thank you, Commissioner Otsuji. Thank you. Uh, I'm in agreement with Commissioner Whalen's comments in regards to placemaking, and I kind of associate that with the public realm area. So hopefully, as we go down the road, those two come uh, together in, uh, in making the decisions of many of these things that he was discussing. Um, I'm going to concentrate my efforts on the additional vehicle use area requirement changes. The first one is on page 33 of 90, uh, paragraph C. Uh, it says, trees used in the vehicle use area shall be canopy form evergreen species at a minimum of 24 inch box size. The question I have is, it says evergreen species, does that uh, eliminate the use of deciduous trees or semi uh, evergreen trees? Staff. I'm sorry, yeah, we have um, Daniel Neary here from Landscape Staff to address that, if he's on the line. Yes, this is Daniel, Senior Landscape Planner. Um, How you doing, Daniel? I'm okay, how are you? Good. Uh, yes, the, the wording would preclude the placement of, uh, of deciduous trees. So it has to be evergreen? Evergreen, yes. And what is the logic behind that? Uh, to continually provide shade over pavement. Okay, I understand. Yeah, I understand that uh, uh, both evergreen and deciduous do all depending on the season of the year. And I kind of relate both evergreen and deciduous trees into the CO2 sequ sequestration uh, rates. So that's the reason I was asking that question. Uh, for example, the California sycamore uh, takes up around 560 pounds per year of CO2. So that's the reason I was asking how we would be eliminating some of the trees that would be uh, advantageous for the climate action plan. Right, it wouldn't be eliminated from, from uh, an entire project, but we are looking for uh, evergreen trees in the VUA, particularly because the types of species that get um, proposed do not provide enough shade. Yeah, I got you. I, I, I see where you're going. Um, a follow-up question, and this could be discussed in, in the 2021 uh, review. Uh, has there been any discussion related to uh, 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 the monoculture that we've created in some of the street trees. What I mean by that is, you know, it's just one variety. Has there been discussion of having a primary and a secondary street tree? So it's kind of integrated with uh, at least two different varieties of trees. Uh, again, this is Daniel Neri. Um, and I can uh, have uh, long range planning chime into this as well, but this is uh, our, our implementation is typically based off of the community plans. So the community plans, some of them are in the process of being updated. Um, they will typically have a primary tree, a secondary tree. I think there's uh, leaning towards uh, more biodiversity. Um, however, um, from our implementation side, we're relying on the, um, the uh, community plans to implement them. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, my last question is on uh, page 36 of 90. Uh, street tree species selection, uh, and it goes down to, let's see, I won't read the whole thing, but I'm just gonna read the last sentence. Palm trees may only be used to satisfy street tree requirements as, a, as an accent, focal, or secondary tree were identified as an acceptable street tree species. I thought we were eliminating the palm tree as a, uh, as a, uh, as a choice for a street tree. I agree with it being accent or focal. 
but I don't agree yes. with it being a secondary tree. Okay, there are um, some historical um, areas of the city that do have palms in them. So um, we are trying to limit the use of the palms to those areas that do have, um, that's where it's identified in the land use plan. Um, so that's how, that's why we're, we're taking this baby step at the moment. And I appreciate your concern for eliminating them completely. And um, we're taking yeah. the first step in that. Okay, great. That's good to hear. So I'm sure there'll be other comments coming in 2021. And just uh, as a comment to palm trees, probably half the palm trees that we do use, I have nothing against palm trees. It's just how we use it this time, but half the palms, uh, uh, varieties are susceptible to many types of pesticides and disease and uh, you know we've confronted this uh, many a time so that has been my main concern in regards to using the, the, the palms as, as a street tree but those are my comments at this point thank you thank you commissioner otsuji uh, commissioner moden Thank you. Um, I think there's a lot of positive things in this um, code update. Um, adult daycare, um, there's really great programs out there for our seniors um, and this will allow flexibility so we can broaden that use. Um, there's a program called PACE that is um, really transformative for seniors on restricted income. So thank you for um, acknowledging that and including that. Um, I also think the moderate income modification on small urban infill projects is really advantageous. Um, uh, and then also the lot coverage modification. So thank you. Um, I did have a question. So I read somewhere that the inclusionary fees or the, the diff fees for inclusionary units are going to be waived. Did I, did I read that right? Um, I, I don't believe as part of this update, um, we included that, but I, I think um, as part of the last update, uh, we are, or, or as part of the inclusionary housing fee or inclusionary housing ordinance, um, they were being waived. But Tom, can you confirm that? I, I agree with what you said, Renee, and I'll let uh, Corinne also chime in, but as a part of the update to the inclusionary housing zoning ordinance, as a part of that specific ordinance, the diff fees for the inclusionary units themselves were waived. Yeah, and that, that just went through the second reading, I believe, um, in July of this year. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that That's um, really all that I had to say on this. Um, and I think I think it's a, a good code update. And I appreciate um, Commissioner Otsuchi's comments on the, the landscaping. We did get a lot of feedback, as you know, from the community um, on, the, on the landscaping and street tree. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Granowitz. Um, actually, I, I agreed with Commissioner Moden on most of what she had to say. She sort of took what I was going to say, but I want to talk about the palm trees. I'm one of the communities, Burlingame, that's a historic district that Brian knows. We fought to have the palm trees made the historic tree of Burlingame. But as I've lived in the neighborhood for 32 years and I'm watching those palm trees get old and needing to come down, some of them, um, I'm pausing at whether just because something is as it was is how it should be in the future. Um, and so I think that we need to have a discussion on whether palm trees in historic districts, just because they were the tree should continue to be, and I would be open to that. I don't know how my neighbors feel about it, but um, I think that perhaps it's a discussion that we should be having because they don't provide any shade. They're incredibly dangerous as the palm fronds fall down, um, and they are not helping us protect the planet. So I. I'm glad to hear that this is baby steps. And um, I'm a little afraid because neighbors can be vicious, sometimes in a good way. Um, but I would like 
to have that discussion. So, um, and I will not be voting for the um, notification moving from 10 days to five days. Community planning groups have a really hard time making the 10 days. And I, I know how the vote's probably gonna go, but I actually agree with CPC on that particular issue. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Boomhauer. So I knew I was going to be last on this one because of how you've been rotating us through. So as expected, all my stuff has pretty much been covered. There's a couple of things I would like to highlight. Um, first of all, I want to compliment staff. Uh, Ms. Mezzo, you, you did a great job. Uh, Mr. Frost, you probably explained the airport issues the best I've ever seen them explained. Um, I, like, like I actually understood them possibly for the first time ever. Um, so thank you both for that. Uh, I also want to give kudos to uh, Ms. Mezzo and even though she's no longer with the department, Laura Black for making the changes to how we're doing these code updates because I have lost track of how many of these code updates I have been through. And this is by far the best explained, the best organized, the best put together uh, code update package that I've seen in the time I've been dealing with it, both on code monitoring team and planning commission. So again, kudos to staff on that. Um, and Mr. Richter, you did a great job too. I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> um, so a uh, couple of things I do want to highlight. I want to echo what uh, Commissioner Granowitz said about palm trees. I too live in a neighborhood where uh, in normal heights where palm trees are the, the historic street tree du jour. And um, I, I gotta be perfectly honest with you, most of the palms were planted a long time ago and they're now 80 feet tall and it looks really cool from far away and really pointless otherwise. Um, so while I generally don't like discrimination um, I think discriminating against palm trees makes perfect sense, um, at least in a street environment. Um, and, and I certainly would push um, staff to continue taking a hard look at that and, and echo what Commissioner Granowitz said. I think we, we really need to think about, even in these historic neighborhoods, um, get, getting away from palm trees as a street tree. Um, I am going to respectfully disagree with, with my colleague, Commissioner Granowitz, on the notification. I think reducing it, um, the, the filing period from 10 days to five days um, once an environmental determination has been made um, makes sense. The information is out there. You can find it. You can file the appeal. And um, we need to continue to try to streamline the process for keeping projects moving forward and avoiding um, unnecessary impediments. Uh, by and large, everything else I, I wanted to talk about has been covered. I want to echo, um, I, I share Vice Chair Whalen's concern about the five-year hard limit on uh, the placemaking. And I, I'm concerned that if we codify that without the ability to extend um, or, or renew those placemaking permits that we're gonna regret it in the future. So I, I think I, I would support making a recommendation to council that that we at least include an option for those, per, eliminate the, the statement that those can't be uh, renewed or extended. Um, but otherwise I'm, I'm fully in support of this that since nobody else has done it, um, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion um, that we recommend council adopt the uh, amendments as proposed by staff, um, knowing with, with the one modification I'm suggesting on placemaking um, and knowing that there will probably be other friendly amendments to this motion. We have a motion. Second. Approval, okay, a second by Commissioner Whalen. Commissioner Boomhauer, was that your, okay? You're, I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now, Commissioner Boomhauer, you know how I feel now every time I'm last. 
uh, <laughs> and in this case, most of what I was going to say, in fact, all of really what I wanted to say has been said, so I won't extend the meeting any longer than it has to be. Um, I do, uh, I agree with Commissioner or Vice Chair Whalen's comments uh, on the, uh, the outdoor dining. Um, I'm hoping if we keep a five-year expiration that can be modified in the future, and it would be nice to see how it works. Um, because we, after COVID, it could be a very different type environment, but it, it, I certainly support that sentiment to keep that. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Otsuji's comments, Commissioner Moden's, um, and Commissioner Granwitz, everybody. So I, I'm well in line with the motion, uh, and I'll stop there. And with that, is there any other commissioners who would like to say anything? So we will go ahead and take our vote. Uh, we have a motion on the floor for approval of the code update. Uh, and that, and Commissioner Boonhauer, could you go ahead and uh, state what modification, again, if you could repeat that? Uh with the only modification being the elimination of uh, the the five year the the elimination of uh, the prohibition on renewal. That's what I'm trying to say. The prohibition on renewal of the placemaking after the five year expiration. Okay. Um, I, what I'd like to do because I don't want anybody to vote against the entire update. Uh, based on that one thing, and I, I'm, I'm sure Commissioner Boomhauer, you would vote for it if, if that was not supported by everyone else. But can I? Uh, let's go through. Can we have any comments on that particular motion? Does anyone have any objection to the the elimination of that prohibition for the five years? And just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. In that case, the the motion. We'll go forward with that one modification and I'll go through a roll call here, uh, starting with Commissioner Boomhauer. Now I will we'll vote, sorry. And Commissioner Granowitz? Um, I, except for item 30, I vote no on just item 30. If we can pull that one. I might need to pull that out as a separate motion. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Um, it's gonna pass, but. For the record. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to actually uh, ask our deputy city attorney. Uh, my, my thought would be that we we postpone the vote on the entire item and pull that item out first, um, or can we deal with that after we make this motion? I would suggest um, pulling that item out, voting on that particular item, and then voting on the remainder of the items. Right, that's, I agree. So. We will postpone the vote. We'll go back to the overall vote and let's talk about item 30. And uh, Commissioner Granowitz, could you go ahead and uh, state how you would like to change um, that I just, item? I, I don't want it to change. So oh. I, I know that the commissioners are all gonna vote for it. I just wanted to register a no vote on that item. Oh, I got you, okay. I got you. I so don't really, I'm, I'm assuming everyone else is going to You're, you're talking it. about Commissioner Boomhauer's. No, no. W which one are you talking about? Can you read Notice that? of right to appeal environmental determination. A 10 to 5. From 10 days to 5 days. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is we, we will just take a vote on that one item. Uh, and that would be, in fact, why don't, uh, instead of taking a vote, you want to make a motion to do that and see if we get a second? Oh, there we go. Well, except if we do that, I could end up voting no on the whole thing. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. <laughs> that really sucks. Someone could second your motion for the sake of the vote. Right. And I probably will. Um, my motion is that I be allowed to vote no on item 30 and yes on everything else. 
has that. I, I think what if, if, if we <laughs> have, if we take a vote on item 30, you will register your no vote and then we'll vote on everything else and then you already yes. registered it. Okay. But um, um, so what I would be doing is making a motion to not approve item 30. To, to eliminate that from this. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we have a motion on the floor and I am going to go ahead and second it just for purposes of getting a vote out. Um, that would be to eliminate item 30 uh, from the code amendment, at least recommend that elimination to city council. Um, and before I start a vote, uh, Deputy City Attorney Newford, can you tell us we're doing this I just want to clarify, um, is it the removal or to recommend n n the council not approve that particular item? Not approve that item. Okay. So we are, so the motion is to recommend to the council that we not approve that item. And let's go through a vote for that. Uh, Commissioner Boomhauer? No. Commissioner Granowitz? Yes, aye. Commissioner Moden? Nay. Commissioner Otsuji? Nay. Vice Chair Whalen? Uh, no. And Chairman Hoffman is a no. Um, so that does not carry. Uh, so now we'll go back to the main motion, which was to approve the code update with one modification um, as expressed by Commissioner Boomhauer. Uh, and I don't know if we need to repeat that. I'll have trouble, Commissioner Boomhauer, if you'd like to do that one more time. And, and maybe it's not necessary, but go ahead. Let's make it clear. So the motion that I'm proposing to make is to approve uh, staff's recommendations with the modification being that uh, the placemaking permits um, that are going to expire in five years have the ability to be renewed. Okay, thank you. So we have that motion. And with that one modification, I'll go through a roll call. Um, Commissioner Boomhauer. Aye. Commissioner Granowitz. Aye. Commissioner Moden. Aye. Commissioner Otsuji. Aye. Commis uh, Vice Chair Whalen. Aye. Chairman Hoffman is an aye. So that passes unanimously. Uh, and that concludes our discussion items. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say before we adjourn, um, great job. <laughs> Sabrina, nice job getting this. Uh, this went very, very smoothly, PJ, the whole staff. So uh, I hope everyone else uh, is happy about this. I so, agree. Yeah, it went well. Nice job, staff. Come so a long that, way. Yeah, in a very short time. So with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, commissioners and staff. Thank you.